at this point our save function is is retrieving the data uh, that that we've typed in well it doesn't matter what the person types in into some of these boxes but it does on others because in theory here the CRN the CRN is what's going to be the unique identifier so there can only be one class 9618B there can be no other class there cannot be a class of Spanish and it's 9618B only Android 1 is 9618B that's the one that's unique that's the one that is base that is going to be the unique identifier just like my email is my unique identifier on Twitter no one can have that email except me so CRN is important here uh, if a person types this and types 9618b lowercase, that's technically different than 9618 uppercase b. To avoid that issue, we're going to force the CRN number or letter that they type here to uppercase, just in case. Uh, so internally, we're going to force the CRN value to be uppercase. That means after we've retrieved it, val crn, now we can do things with it, or do things to it. So after this console output, we're going to reference that object, whatever they typed, val crn, the jQuery object of val crn, the jQuery variable of val crn. What we're going to do is, we're then going to use the equals, we're going to change it. We're going to set it to something new. It was set to something a moment ago, but now it will be set to the uppercase version of it. So we'll do again here the same object, but now our trick is dot to uppercase method. So we're using the jQuery method to force it to uppercase on what it currently was and set it to the new value. So if they type uppercase or lowercase, doesn't matter. It will always force it uppercase. So force letters to uppercase via jQuery. There's an equivalent JavaScript method, plain old JavaScript. But again, we created a jQuery object, so we can only use jQuery methods on it. Now, if they type uppercase or lowercase, we're covered. It's a lot easier to do this than, uh, than have them be uppercase or lowercase because they're different. An uppercase A is different than a lowercase A. So next, what we're going to do is Yes. It's one. It's one, but we're reusing it. Our first instance was created here with a var keyword. We're not using var anymore, so we're simply reusing the same instance. Okay, next, I want to bundle these three pieces of data together as one unit. For another three pieces, three separate pieces, I want them as one piece of data. We'll create another variable. We'll call this a class. This is data that defines a class. I'm not using jQuery. There's no dollar symbol. This is plain old JavaScript. Equals curly braces semicolon. I'm going to say here. Bundle the data together in JSON format. JSON format is, once you learn the syntax, it's super obvious. How many of you have heard of JSON before today? JSON? No one. Okay. Well, there's a thing called JSON, and it's a way that it stores data very plainly. <clears throat> it's bundles of data. It has a key and a value pair. The syntax is curly braces. That's it. And we just follow the syntax and it groups it together. So I can put 40 pieces of data and all of that is stored in one variable. That's not quite the database because this variable is temporary. 
all variables are temporary as long as the app is running. Once we bundle it together, though, then we can put it into our database. And the way JSON format is, is with curly braces. For readability, I'm going to break those curly braces. And basically, don't write this yet, but we have key and value pairs, comma, key and value pairs, comma, until the last one, then no comma. It just ends like that. So any amount of data can be stored this way. And JSON format is very, very popular. Lots of websites use this. Twitter and Flickr and Google, all of these websites use it. Uh, if you want to make your own, like, Twitter app, well, you need a way to interface with the Twitter database, and Twitter will kick back data to you, often in JSON format. It will have some key with some value. Then we have to process the raw data. This is JSON format. It's simply in curly braces, and it's simply some key, some value. Notice I have quotes. That's part of the syntax as well. Just making a quick note up here. Uh, use curly braces. around sets of key and value pairs use quotes double quotes I believe is the official standard use double quotes for each key or value unless it's a variable or number Separate each one with a comma. Until final pair with nothing. That's the syntax. Curly braces. This is a bundle of data. This is a piece of the bundle. It's key, it's value, it's name, it's value. John, uh, last name, Smith. First name, John. Age, 40. Comma, height, 5 feet. Just a bundle of data that, uh, with a schema that we invent. A database, you know, has these various fields. I have this, I have to do attendance for all of these classes. This is data out of a database. It's people's student ID numbers, birthdays, last names, first names, data from a database. This can be bundled together in a, J in, in a JSON object. We can create a birthday field with a birthday, and then a last name field, a first name field, a, uh, a student ID field. And all of that is bundled as one person, or one record, or one student. We're doing this for a class. PouchDB stores data in JSON format. That's the whole point of this. In many of these modern related types of databases store data in this kind of format. What's unique is that we need to have an underscore ID as the unique identifier for a bundle of data. I'm not going to, and you should not write comments in between those curly braces. That's going to break it. You should not have any comments, single or double line comments, in a bundle of data. It's just the data. So if I want to write any comments for this, I'll write it before or after. <clears throat> so a PouchDB object. Say a patch the record object document must have an ID in that format. Do you see an underscore? It has to have an underscore. It's reserved. We can make fields of any name or length 
but we have to use the underscore ID. That's how we have separation of data. That's how there can be seven victors in this social network, because we're separating each one with a unique identifier, such as an email. Everyone is not going to have victor at victor.com. Someone's going to have victor at gmail.com, victor at apple.com, victor at hotmail.com, whatever. Everyone's going to have a separate email. That's what identifies that user. We could store a date there. Uh, you know, dates are unique as well. We can store date down to the second. So we can have 20 victors in a social network depending on when they signed up. Most likely, very unlikely, you're not going to have two people named Victor signing up for a social network at the exact same second in time. So that ID, that way, could be a way to keep them separate. What we're doing is we're saving ID. We're going to say CNAME, name of the class, and CINST, name of the instructor. The value is what the person typed into val crn, not in quotes, val name, and val inst. So partially the record must have an underscore id. Yes? That would make more sense, yes, let's do that. C class, class class. No, C, I'm doing C short for class. Class name, yeah. Class instructor, class name for a class. Oh, what did we call it? Val class? Yeah. Oh, there we go, Val class. Okay, yeah. That makes sense. Um, there we go. So at the top there, we uh, we have the val class from in class. Yes. So C name. Yeah, we should call that C class. Yes. Whatever we call these things, we just need to be consistent. C class. C inst. This one though is the one that has to be this underscore a. It would be interesting to see what this looks like. So let's do a little console output. Console log a class. We've bundled all that data together as one unit. Let's see what it looks like in the console. Type some stuff, click go. You'll see the output from up there as before. You can comment that one out if you want. And then you'll see the data bundled together as an object. Those up there, it's three separate pieces of data. Now it's been bundled as one object, a JSON formatted object, which we then can put into the database. Let's see. So I'm going to load that, class 123, Android 1, Campos, Go. I get the original output, which was separate. And then I get output that this is an object. It has an ID, it has a class, it has an inst. I can further look at it in other ways here. I have a field of C class, a field of C inst, a field of ID, a bunch of other low level stuff, whatever ID I wrote, last name or first name or whatever, and the name of the class. That's all bundled as one unit now, one object. Up here, this is separate data.
let's say in this console here, we'll say the object say what I'm displaying at the moment is the object. So in quotes is the string plus what the object is. The ID. Now we'll say the CRM. So with object-oriented programming, which we've been doing all along, we have the object of console and the method of log. We have also sort of up here the object of in inst and the method of val checking the property of value. We have an object of in instructor and we're checking its property of value. This JSON object we created is, is that. It's an object. It has an object which we then we can check properties or do or run methods. So if I only want to retrieve the CRM value of the class of a class object, my syntax is a class dot underscore ID. I want to display only or work only with the ID in that object. Looks a little awkward, but I'm simply referencing a property, a field, so to speak, in that object. So I'm sort of breaking it down here just for fun to illustrate the point. the class name is going to be a class dot C class. The instructor's name A class dot c inst. So this is all bundled together as one object, and I can retrieve each individual piece of the object. the whole object <coughs> or individual elements. With that syntax, with dot notation, fancy way of saying, you know, use the dot. There's your object dot. There's the property, there's the field in this object, give me its value. So when you save and run this, you'll see your data in different ways. Sort of like the raw data on the first console up there, then the data as an object, and then the pieces of the data again. This is just a little quick output with some labels, some strings, so I can tell what I'm looking at if I simply only wrote these parts here, I just see a lot of data and it's kind of hard to tell what I'm working with, so I put some strings there to label myself what I'm, what I'm showing. So let's see if uh, mine works. What, what it should do is If I put in some, uh, so 
from class, you know, 7, 8, 3, A. I'll put a lowercase a. Remember, we have that two uppercase. Uh, this will be Japanese 2 with instructor joins. Click go. My output is, there's my first console output. It's just the raw data. Then it's the object. Uh, then the actual fields there, the CRN was that. Notice it went to uppercase. And then name and instructor. Yes? I mean, it has the word object. Sometimes it does that. Um, I noticed that in Chrome, sometimes it, it just says, well, we're viewing an object, but not actually to view in the object. It's oh, kind of hard to explain. I think Chrome right now... It was showing it earlier, and now it's not. I think if I close Chrome and open it again, I think it goes back. I think it's a bug or a quirk of it. And so here I'm uh, showing the actual fields. All right, so it should uh, work something like that up to this point. Any, <coughs> any questions? Yes. Is the whole point of doing console log basically so that the coder is just going to keep saying word logs? Then everything word would work without the console log, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we know what our end result is, so we can skip all these console logs. But if we were trying to build this app little by little, I'd want to give myself feedback to see I'm on the right track. So the console log is very helpful to give ourselves as the developers some feedback, some hints, some clues, some troubleshooting. Okay, so this is getting us to the point where we seem to be able to retrieve the data. We're bundling it together. It's then now time to insert it into the database, uh, to keep it in the, in the database. The cool thing is that PouchDB is like local storage in that it will save your data. It'll keep your data. When you close the browser and come back, it'll still be there. Plain old variables go away, even if they're jQuery variables, they go away. They either go away when the function is complete or when you close the browser. Well, PouchDB, like local storage, will store our data permanently until we, you know, clear out completely the memory or uninstall the browser. And eventually when we get this into our Cordova project, it'll store the data, you know, the 200 megabytes or whatever, in the, in the app on the device. So if the person goes into their settings and completely wipes out the memory of the of the app, okay, your data is gone. If they uninstall your app, the data is gone. If they, you know, wipe their whole phone, the data is gone. But then that's why it also has the ability to replicate to a server. So if we build in ways that once we store stuff to the database and such, replicate it to a server. So their phone dies, everything gets wiped out, they restore. And you know, with the IDs or whatever method we have set up, we can retrieve the data back to the device. So let's put this data into the database. After this console output, we will now use our first real PouchDB command. All of this has been jQuery. It's JavaScript. It's agnostic to what we're trying to do. Now the actual pouch commands db.put. Remember way back several lines, we have the object of database. We have we had db equals new pouch. So now we can use a bunch of pouch commands, a bunch of pouch methods on that object. We have the put command. So pouch db command, pouch db method to put data into the database. Most met most pouch db methods need one argument or parameter and can have 
optional options, optional options, and usually a uh, result callback. We're trying to put data into the database. We have various results that could happen. Either the data gets stored into the database successfully or unsuccessfully. Very common results. It either worked or it didn't. Yes or no. If we try to change data in the database, we could have those results as well. Yes, it worked. We changed the data. No, it didn't work. We didn't change the data. So then we have callbacks. We have functions. We have, uh, like, what's next? It worked that we put the data in. What's next? Well, display the data on screen. It didn't work to put the data. What's next? We need to fix that. So pretty much uh, every PouchDB method or command has a result, a positive result or a negative result, a yes or a no. It worked, it didn't. What we're trying to put into the database is our bundle of data. What's our bundle of data called? A class. That's our bundle of data. We grouped it all together. We're trying to put it into the database. Comma. There's going to be a result, success or failure. Function, open close parentheses, there's either going to be failure, comma, success. These are arbitrary. This can be kitty, comma, cat. Yes, no, or no, yes. Bad, good. These are, these are arbitrary. This is a result of trying to put it in. The result will be a failure or a success in this order, the bad or the good. Curly braces. There. So we're going to see this syntax over and over. Try to do something, a put, a get, a restore, comma, some result, which would be a failure or a success most often. Curly braces. I'm going to break those curly braces and say console.log failure console.log success. I want to see that because a lot of these modern libraries you do something and you get some result and the result is it is is a, is often in JSON format some result, some object, some some data that comes back to you. When we did the camera in Cordova, when we tried to take a photo, it had whatever it was navigator dot camera or something, and then it had a result, and the result was either an error or the data of the photo. So here it's going to give me something. Failure could be a message or something. Success is some kind of message. I want to maybe see what this will give me. Obviously, the, the pouchdb.com documentation explains everything that could, could happen. But here, just to explore it, I want to see what's the result of trying to put a class into the database. Let's save it and run it. Let's see what happens. Let me ref refresh that, and maybe I'll put real data for the first few times just to see it, and then later I'll put gibberish. I'll click go. This is my point of putting a little <coughs> bit of string in console before outputting. I get null. 
that is the part that it's showing the failure. I did not get a failure. I got the, <coughs> I got the result of the success. The success, it gave back to me an object, a JSON formatted object. There's the curly braces. OK, true, comma, ID. That's my ID that I bundled into my data, comma, and a revision. Which I'll get back to that in a moment. I'm going to save again something else. This will be class 222, Android 2, Instructor Smith, Go. I'm putting way too much output, which I'm going to comment out. But here, I get again. I got an OK, true. I got a success. I saved my data with the unique ID of 222 with the revision. Well, OK, I'm, I'm going to save class 222. And this is Japanese 3 with instructor uh, Kajiwara. I'll click Go. Now the failure happened. Status <coughs> name to conflict. Document update conflict. Undefined is the success. So error 409 happened. In short, I'm trying to reuse the same ID. Okay, I'll remove that ID. Great, and I'll save it. Oh, another error. Status 412. Missing the required ID. Something went wrong. Nothing went wrong. So doing console output with some message besides what the result is is going to be very useful for me to understand what I'm telling myself in the console. And we have all along basically just put some quick console output without any context. <coughs> I'm going to quickly forget what am I looking at. So by giving myself a further note as a string, that null now will make sense. No, it's not, something went wrong, no, no, no nothing went wrong. Um, there was no failure. There was no failure object returned. This is the whole point. This is a callback function, a return value. I'm trying to put data and something will get returned to me, a failure or a success. So that's what shows up. I'm going to close the browser completely just to further test it. I'm closing the browser completely and I'm running it with a brand new brand new run. I'm going to put data again, this time class 777x, and this is programming 101 with instructor Ahmed. Go. Something went wrong. No. No, it didn't. Nothing went wrong, and I got the object. And here again, Chrome is kind of showing it a little odd. But go over to your application. Go over to your Index TV viewer. Into your pouch database, document by sequence. There's all the data I've been saving so far. The first two classes and the third one I just saved as objects, which I can open in further view. So try to save something. Switch to your application, index DB, your database by sequence, and view your data that way. Here's my first object. The CRM is right there, the ID, obviously, the one I just saved, the third piece of data that I save is right there. It's the third line. One, two, three. Or counting with zero, zero, one, two. There it is, seven, seven, x, which I just typed right there. Because uh, my console might get cluttered up, I like to kind of clean it out once in a while with that little clear. And again, just to force an error, 
if I don't put anything into CRN, which is the required one, and I try to go, something went wrong, and it shows me the data, nothing went wrong, undefined. It, it did not go right. Something went wrong. Status 412, name of the problem is a missing ID. The message is ID is required for puts. And if I check my application here, it didn't store it. If I refresh, it didn't store it. I'm missing an ID. So you should see something getting saved to your application. You should see feedback that makes sense. Let's pause there. Anyone need any help? We are saving stuff to a database now. A database that lives in the web browser. Only in the Chrome browser. If I open up the same project in Firefox, it's a different browser, it's a different database. They have the same name, but it's separated by different folders and all of that. So this data is not going to be there in Firefox. Or also, if I completely clean the history and the cache and everything, it will go away. Eventually, when we get this onto our apps, we're going to have then data saved to the device. And that, there's a way also for the user to delete the data, you know, go to my apps and delete my memory for my apps and such, or uninstall the app. But uh, I also, if you recall, I closed the browser completely and I ran it again and it's showing my data. It's showing the first and the second one. So it's permanent data, like local storage, but better because we can bundle a data, a piece of data in JSON format. Local storage, not really. It has to be in a simpler format. Anyone, any, anyone need any help? We have a, uh, a Yeah, we need we need semicolons because each one is a console log command completely.
take a quick look at the PouchDB documentation to see what we've done. You can go back to PouchDB.com and um, let's look at... Uh, we can look at it first. Uh, well, let's look at it here. Let's look at guides at the top and then we can look at working with documents at the left. So PouchDB uses a document. That's our bundle of data. PouchDB is a NoSQL database, meaning that you store unstructured documents rather than explicitly specifying a schema with rows and tables and all of that. So here's a document. Here's a bundle of data. Notice again, ID is required. So a unique identifier for this cat is mittens. The name is mittens. The occupation is it's a kitten. Age, three. It's a number, not in quotes, because all of this is string data. That's a number, so no quotes. Then we need a complex. We could say hobbies. Hobbies is a field, so to speak, and there's three hobbies here in an array. Square brackets, remember, is an array. So now three pieces of data are being saved into one field. Hobbies. Playing with balls of yarn. Come. Chasing lazy pointers. Come. Looking hella cute. At the end. And that is one piece of data in hobbies, which is all part of one kitten named Mittens. If we had another kitten named Sammy, it would have an ID of Sammy and its data. So if you've used other kinds of databases, traditional databases, here's what their equivalents are. Uh, a table, I think what they should say with table, there is an equivalent, I would say, is the whole database itself, perhaps. Then there's a row of data in SQL, and here it's a document. That is a row of data. A column is a, is a field, which are these fields. A primary key has to be underscore ID. We're looking at an index. It's a view. It's pulling the data out of the database. Yes? So for this, uh, for this uh, part DB, is, is it only allowed for this one parameter? Yes. So it's not like a traditional database that can be relational. Yeah. Uh, there's one primary key for each bundle of data. But the way you can sort of make it relational is to create a field, you know, called whatever, uh, link, and then have the name of the other, you know, sort of a row. So it's, it's not inherently like a traditional relational database where you have keys that are linked together. Yeah. That is one of the big things that if we have experience in a traditional database is very confusing or odd with this style. But PouchDB is not the only NoSQL database. There's a whole movement of this kind of database. Part of the reason is it doesn't a lot of them don't require servers. Um, you know, MongoDB is very popular. Uh, some big websites like Twitter or whatever, big websites are, are in that way. So it goes on to say you, know, you can read up on this in a bunch of places. It's basically, basically about key and value storage. No big schema benefits, all of that. All right, so here uh, it's exactly what we did. All that data is bundled together as an object, and then db.put. That's it. We have also get. We'll see that we can get data from the database, db.get. What are we getting? A unique ID. Then there's a function afterwards. What's the result of that? And here is simply console output. So then it retrieves the data. There's a field underscore rev. This is the other uh, reserved field that we cannot use unless we know what we're doing. This is how we can keep track of revisions in our data. This 
kitten right now is three years old, eventually it'll be four years old. We need to update its age. So doc.age. We're affecting only the age field in this document. So that's the syntax we've seen. And then we need to give it a new revision number, you know, two dash something. We'll, we'll see how to deal with revisions a little later. But this is how we can keep track of changes to the data. Um, it's a randomly generated ID that changes whenever a document is updated or created. So updating the document, etc. And then we have, okay, we've got a new age. Something's changed to the document, to the data. And our rev has changed to dash something. Let's uh, look at the top under APIs, API. That other screen was, a, was an overview. Here under API, create or updated doc, db.put, tells you how it actually works. Create a new document or update an existing document. So if I want to change something that I wrote, we still use db.put. We'll see how later. Uh, some restrictions on what we could call these names. If you store non-JSON data, you, you may see inconsistencies. So we should be storing JSON data. Uh, and here again, db.put. Now here, we've got examples of code, which is very useful. But we've got them in callbacks, format, promises format, and async functions. We're going to be focusing on callbacks. So any of this documentation that you see, you should switch it to callbacks. Promises is another way to do it. It's just different syntax, which honestly, it's one of the things on my to-do list that I want to do. If you've taken my classes before, I haven't done it yet, sorry. Uh, I want to learn Promises, because they seem to be very useful in the way of the future. Does anyone know how to use, use Promises in JavaScript? Okay, never mind. No one. Promises, don't worry about it. You want callbacks. Callbacks is the word which is simply this kind of syntax, right? We're putting in data, here's our bundle. They did it very basically. They didn't wrap it together in, a, in, a, in an object yet. They're feeding the raw JSON data into it. You can do that too. We made it easier on ourselves by putting it into a class first, comma, a function. They're calling it error and response. Again, these values don't matter what you call them. We made it make sense. Failure, success. Same thing here, error, positive response. They did a little bit of an if statement. If there was an error, then return to the console what the error was. We did a little clunky, it worked, but we'll do it better in a moment with if-else statements. Uh, we have other things. We have get. When we do get, well, we need to get data using a document ID, an underscore ID. We could have options and we have a callback. Here's an example. We try to get something from the database with the unique identifier my doc. The result is an error or the doc. They change it here again. Failure success. If there was a failure, then to the console, write that failure. And you get something like that. JSON data that says what the ID was, what revision it was, and other data. If there was an error retrieving the data, it would say, you know, uh, ID colon, tr uh, you know, error colon true, message colon what the error was, error code colon what the error code was. So it's giving you back a result in JSON format. Yes? If we create a database, it would be giving us the revision to add some more stuff into it. So that we do we would do it a little bit differently, and it's not to the database, it's to the document. Oh. But up here is the other way. We did dot put, which creates the random number for us. We have actually dot post, which will let us specify the value. 
which even I think the documentation says don't do this. Do the dot put. Let it generate the random number. We, we will be able to work with it, even though it's random. Yeah, so uh, it, they tell us here, don't use your own numbers. We, we got it. But they have db.post for legacy, I guess. So we can put our own revision into it. See right here, po put versus post, the basic rule. Uh, put does it the right way regarding the ID. So all the documentation is here, replication, how do I replicate this to a server, it's in here, examples, etc. Kind of complex because you need a server, you need your infrastructure, and a bunch of things could go wrong. You know, was there an active connection? Did the, did the password to connect work? Once you start to deal with data in the cloud, then you expose yourself to so many cyber threats because you need to connect to a database where valuable information is there. You need strong passwords and to randomize the password and all of that, and you need a server that doesn't get hacked and lots of headaches. But Pouch gives us the ability to copy our data to a server. Let's clean this up a little bit more and then we'll go on. We have our put and we have some console output. Let's, uh, after that console output, we'll set up an if else. Uh, conditional statement. If failure. That's where the something went wrong message should appear. Or else, besides failure, the else is success. So that's where the success would go. So now we won't get both results. It doesn't make sense we try to get both results. Now it's one or the other. Try to put the class, something will happen, either failure or success. We have to check that if it's a failure, do something about it. Or else it's not a failure, it's a success, do something about it. We could switch them, of course. If success, show the success stuff. Or else it's got to be a failure, so do the failure stuff. Here, uh, check which happened. Success, failure or success via if else. Let's say if there was a successful save. Do you see that when you when you when you click the go button, everything that I typed is still there. I have to delete it to type something new. So if there was a successful save, it might be nice to clear those those fields to write a new class data. So we'll have to write our own function here. We'll call it fn clear form, which we need to define. But the success, this is the success part. Else, in this case, is 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 a success. All right. So fn uh, 
clear form is a function that we will invent uh, to clear the form and maybe do some other cleanup on screen or to pop up a message that says thank you or something. So we're, we're going to call here a function which we need to define. So after the end of our save function, let's create a clear form function. If we created it in the function of save class, we could only use it basically in the function of clear of save class. So after the end of function save class, we'll define our function with function clear. So it's global scope. We can use it everywhere. And function clear form. Function to clear the form, clean up other things, and give feedback. For the moment, all that we really need to do is to uh, clear those input fields. And the way we can do that is referencing the L form class. Just trust me on this, square bracket zero, and then dot reset. We're using the reset jQuery method to reset the form. And the zero there is means our first form. We can have more than one form in the in, in, in the project. We don't want to reset all the forms. We want to reset the first form. So now function clear form is defined. Whenever we input data and it gets saved properly, we'll get that console output and it should then clear the fields. Save it and run it and, and try it out. Type another class and then you should see that the form input fields clear out. So even something like that, when I use someone else's website or someone else's app, it just works. I type a name, I click save, it does it. We are now making it, we are programming, and we're in charge of it. And you saw that it did not empty itself by default. We have to program it. That's why, again, all of this stuff that we're doing, it's complicated and it's hard. There's a lot to do, there's a lot to keep track of, to beta test and bug test and and uh, at least though we're in charge of it and we can guide its direction. Let's see if that worked. I'm going to... at a certain point I'm just going to type gibberish because I don't have time. Go. My output's doing the usual. And it cleared. Notice I was typing simply, well, I could do this. I could type weird symbols. This goes back to when we were talking about, you know, your input when we were doing names. We didn't we haven't addressed that, so it'll gladly take this gibberish. And now that you've got an ID, a unique identifier of hash mark percent, hash mark percent, carrot, etc. You probably don't want that saved, so we would have to sanitize the input, which we'll deal with later. But we're seeing we are saving data, and if I go look at my app, the index DB by sequence, we can also look at it in other ways like this. Document store is another way to look at the data. So you see the actual data this way. We don't have any attachments. We haven't actually saved you know, a picture in the database, which we shouldn't, but we can see it there. And what else? Uh, we don't have any blobs either, that's just raw data. By sequence, by document rev. Here's another way to look at it. Look, show me my data alphabetically by ID. So I had typed in the symbols fifth. But in this view, it shows it first. It's just alphabetical order. And that one's last, even though it was fourth. Mm -hmm. Yes? In that initial array in that code, it was zero, right? What, what does the one represent? Is that 
Well, it's, it's just two ways to look at it. We, we can look at it zero-based or one-based. So you see one was the first data that I saved. Oh, okay, sorry, the zero there. Okay, yeah, this is, a, this is related to which form? Our first form, our zero-width form. Oh, okay. We can have more than one form to reset. We're resetting the zero-width, the first form. Oh, okay. Let's take one more break, and then we'll uh, do a little bit more. It's uh, 8.40. If your code works at this point, good. Take a break. If not, call me over, but here's the way it is so far. So doing clear is not that useful. It keeps the memory somewhere, somewhere in the memory. Here we permanently deleted it and it frees up the ID. And when we make it ourselves, we will delete it the right way. Okay. 
So I actually didn't want to. We didn't leave the console. But actually, if we want to refresh the whole database, it's on the code. We will right now, exactly. That's why we've set up initially up here somewhere in its database. We've set up our initial re initialization that will then re store okay. the database potential. So, this zero is we have one form. Mm -hmm. Zero means one. One first. first. Just, just like in any array, we have the first item of the array, which is zero. And right there, we're saying we're clearing the first form. This is first form. Yeah. So, this is a collection. Why you mention this? This is Well, we have to the first one. To the first one. What I've read in the documentation that seems to be a quirk or maybe a bug in yeah. jQuery because we we never wanted really to ID exactly. Yes. Why not? Yes. Yeah. Why we need to? If we remove this, then it won't work. I have to use it. Yeah. Like index, it will make it only by pointing this is like a collection of array. Exactly. No. So it's the first time of the array, but we are using the ID anyway, so it shouldn't need it. But we can. Yes. 
song is in the For everyone, let's go on. We have a few more things, then we'll then we'll wind down.